Okay. In interest of time, I think we should get started. I think we already have quite a few people that have already joined. So welcome everyone to our third um, CI se seminar. My name is Marina Pinheiro and I'll be the chair for the session today. Um, today we're going to hear from four speakers, but before I go ahead and present then, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm hosting this meeting from the lands of the Darug and Guringai people, the traditional custodians of this land. Um, so please feel free to add to the chat the Aboriginal land that you're joining from today. As I understand, we have people across uh, Australia joining today. Um, I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and recognise and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of New South Wales. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islands peoples here today. So the topic of this session is a progress on the Australian Fall Prevention Guidelines. Uh, we're going to be hearing a, an update from four um, speakers. Um, we are going to have the presentations from the four speakers first. So they're going to go back to back. And then at the end, each of them will speak for roughly 10 minutes. And then that will leave us with 20 minutes um, for questions at the end. Um, please feel free to send your questions via the chat, but you're also welcome to raise your hand at the end to ask your questions. Um, and as there are quite a few of us here today, uh, I'd like to ask you to make sure you are on mute um, so the session can run smoothly. So we're going to hear today, first of all, an overall um, of the of the uh, guidelines. We're going to hear from Professor Steve Lord. So Professor Steve Lord is a science professor at UNSW and he's also an NHMRC Senior Principal Research Fellow. He has ex extensive experience in falls research. Um, then we're going to hear from Charlotte McLennan. She's a PhD candidate uh, at the University of Sydney, and she has a clinical background in aged care uh, and rehabilitation. So Charlotte is a, a physiotherapist. Sorry, Mama. No, I, don't I can't hear otherwise. Yeah. If you could please mute your microphones, that would be great. Thank you. And then we're going to hear from another PhD student, uh, Rick Dawson. Uh, he's an experienced aged care physiotherapist, and he's going to give us the update uh, of the guidelines on residential aged care. And last but not least, we're going to hear from Dr. Jasmine Mennett. Uh, she's a research fellow at the at Neuro at Neuroscience Research Australia. Um, so let's get started with Professor Steve Lord. So Sandra, if you could go to the next slide please that would be great and i'd like to welcome um, professor steve lord thank you thank you very much uh, marina it's great to be here and it's great to have so many people online so i'm going to start off um, with a little bit of a background a little bit of a history which will just describe you know why the current guidelines that are basically finished now and ready for dissemination for um, consultation and feedback are the way they are and how they got here. Uh, so next slide, please, Sandra. So it all goes back actually 20 years. So it's a nice sort of 20 year anniversary of the first guidelines that were produced. And these were from Queensland Health. And they, at the time they were directed to um, public hospitals and also the government owned aged care facilities in Queensland. So this was the birth of them. And it was an initiative that came from within Queensland uh, Paul Barden at the time was one of the project officers who worked on this. Uh, next slide, please. So this then was um, picked up by what was then the Australian Council for Safety and Quality in Healthcare, and it was relatively newly established. And it was prime aims, basically, as the name implies, to promote safety uh, in the context of um, quality improvement and care. And Falls was actually one of uh, uh, at the only specific issue that the commission, uh, the council at the time took on. It was mainly more general issues, but Falls being the major cause of harm that occurred within hospitals in particular was the impetus for this specific um, guideline. Next, please. So this resulted in the first iteration of national guidelines. It became known as the Green Box. And at the time, there was quite substantial funding to fund not only guidelines, but implementation guidelines as well, as well as a lot of fact sheets, videos, and it all got packaged together in a nice green box. So that was 
uh, the first iteration. So that was two years later, and uh, it came out. It still had an emphasis on uh, residential care and hospitals at this point. So this was again uh, in 2009, four years later, revised and updated. And in this time, the move was made to have three separate versions, one for community, one for hospitals, and one for residential aged care, because it made good sense for people in one setting to really only look at the evidence where they were working and not go through a lot of evidence from other settings. So this was, was the uh, the next version of the the guidelines, and these were published in 2009. Next, please. And this uh, uh, I'll go into a little bit about how the, these were developed. The government. So is so there someone not on mute? The chair, because Sue so will be the chair for that meeting. Right. And I'm going to be strongly advising that as the chair, she does not. It's um, um it's a number, not a person. It's <laughs> Michael. Oh, it's Lorraine here. Michael, I think it's Michael Fag. Would you mind going on mute, please? Thanks, Lorraine. Thank you. So anyway, main changes to the 2009 guidelines. Uh, there was a lot of evidence that was emerging. Uh, we need, needed better links between recommendations and the evidence. And, you know, the two settings were included in one and community care was not uh, included at all. So that's why the 2009 guidelines were developed. Uh, next, please. Next, please, Sandra. So there was a, quite a process in this. There was an expert advisory group, focus groups, a survey. Uh, the National Injury Working Group uh, at the time were involved. It went out to colleges, organisations. It had uh, expert input and we had two international reviewers at the time. They were David Oliver and Claire uh, from, New, from the UK and Claire Robertson from New Zealand, who both looked at it when they were finished. Next, please. So the evidence at the time, as you'd expect, uh, a search of the literature, an update of the Cochrane reviews at the time, feedback from professionals, policy staff, and a lot of uh, in individual input from uh, experts from either the working group or known experts working in the field, as well as input again from societies like the College of Physicians uh, and so on. Next, please. At the time then we used uh, NHMRC uh, guidelines in terms of what you'd use for levels of evidence. And this was the M NHMRC evidence at the time. Basically it was based on the quality of the evidence where it was published and in what form. So at the top you had, if the recommendation was based on evidence gained from a systematic review or a, rel or a number of relevant randomized control trials, down to level two, at least one properly controlled randomized controlled trial, right down to four, uh, evidence from a case series, post-test, et cetera. It's, it really did look at the quality of the presentation and where the uh, evidence came from. It didn't really look at what the recommendation was in terms of strength and would you recommend it, but this is what was used at the time. Next, please. So with all these things, there was a bureaucracy and a, a levels of endorsement. You can see it went from the subcommittees uh, to uh, the commission itself, to the Australian Minister's Advisory Committee, and finally by the Australian Health Minister's Conference, uh, AHMC, in November. So it went through a due process, so it was finally given, you know, the full accreditation. Next, please. Next, please, Sandra. So this is uh, what it produced, uh, updated guidelines, three versions of them. There's the full um, guideline known as the Bible of about 200 words by small guidebooks that might be used more on site that were about uh, 20 pages and fact sheets that were uh, designed specifically, for example, doctors, nurses, allied health, support workers, and so on. Next, please. Uh, back one, thanks. So that's where we got to in 2009. 
And so it's been a long time since then. So the iteration had been 2003, 5, 9, and then nothing till now. So this, uh, in the interim, uh, the Australian and New Zealand Fall Prevention Society had been trying to update these uh, because uh, it looked like the Commission at the time uh, were not not interested in a revision. And so along the way, uh, we got partway through. Um, Jasmine Manant did a number of searches to get them nearly ready, but we couldn't quite, due, due to lack of resources, actually quite ever get a uh, an Australian uh, full society version ever published. But uh, interestingly, in part due to the recent um, Royal Commission into Aged Care, there's been a lot more increased in interest in updated guidelines. <clears throat> so in fact, the uh, members of the society uh, actually were then commissioned to update the current guidelines. So the are uh, the authors there. You can see there was a lot of assistance with the searches from a number of people online and also a critical view uh, generously provided by a number of different people to produce the current ones that we have um, just about in press. Next, please. So this is what we used to update them. So we started with the 2009 guidelines so as the basis, and they've been informed by a lot more evidence that we have available today. <clears throat> so importantly, the World Falls guidelines that came out last year, the World Hopper Organization Physical Activity Guidelines, which we've taken on board, and then some quite recent um, Cochrane reviews that cover various uh, areas that are very important to fall prevention in community uh, and um, residential care and hospitals. And in fact, we undertook a specific one ourselves to update the Cameron uh, systematic review to make sure it was very much up to date with the latest evidence. Next, please. So we've changed what we used in terms of uh, guiding uh, the levels of evidence. We've moved to a modified grade version and this takes into account the strength of the recommendation in addition to the quality of evidence. This is much more uh, in concert with what is uh, suggested these days. So we've got the strength of a recommendation that's strong or weak and the quality of evidence going from high through to low. So a recommendation at the highest level will be 1A, for example. And so this is a, a way of actually giving an indication that it's actually very much worthwhile undertaking this intervention or initiative, rather than just saying this has come from a systematic review. Next, please. So where we're up to, all of the uh, guidelines are drafted. They're uh, back with the commission. Uh, the final phase is consultation. So it's already been through some internal and external consultation, specifically in relation to all of the recommendations and their evidence, but further formal consultation is going to take place uh, in September or October, where the Commission will make the uh, guidelines available and also provide a, an online survey for people to comment. And there'll be lots of open text fields so people can say what they think is good, bad, indifferent, needs um, improving, or there's a gap, etc. So that's the, uh, the final phase where we've got to go, and we could uh, consider this part of the consultation too. So all comments and feedbacks, uh, feedback is welcome. Next, please. And so the final part, the launch itself, we've got a deadline. So we're all working to our conference, the Australian New Zealand Fall Prevention Society and World Falls Guidelines, uh, World Falls Congress Joint Conference, which will be in Perth in November. So that's when all will be done and <laughs> Uh, okay. guidelines will be um, released and launched. So that's the background and uh, gives you an idea that they go back actually on 20 years of history from an initial initiative uh, and now incorporating all of uh, what we have as the latest evidence, the latest evidence into the three volumes. So I'm going to stop there and hand over to Charlotte, who's going to talk specifically about the recommendations uh, from the hospital guidelines. Fantastic. 
Thanks, Steve, and thanks, everyone. So, yes, I'm going to talk specifically um, around the hospital uh, where our overarching message really is that many falls can be prevented in this um, space with the systematic implementation of tailored interventions. And I'll go through the specific recommendations now that, um, you know, all the draft recommendations that we'll see in the guidelines. So the first recommendation is that tailored education should be provided to older people who do not have a significant cognitive impairment and to all all staff and families. And so we can see that level of evidence is 1B. I, I won't go through this for all the um, recommendations, but just to, for you to see it in practice. So one, indicating that this is really strong evidence and B, relating to the quality of the evidence, indicating that further research is likely to um, impact our confidence with the level of effect of this intervention on reducing falls. So um, important, I think, to note around this recommendation is that the education really needs to be tailored. We can't have that one-size-fits-all approach. Um, and that the education should really be around informing staff, patients and families that for most individuals, when they come to hospital, they are at an increased risk of falling and then going beyond that to educate them about how this risk can be reduced while they're in hospital. Okay, next point, the next recommendation is that personalised multifactorial fall prevention interventions based on assessment of individual risk factors should be provided for all older people. Now, we have an additional point related to this recommendation, which, Sandra, if you click, tick, should come through, and that's that calculating a fall risk score is not necessary. So really the focus is on implementing an intervention based on assessment. It's not on the assessment or the fall risk score itself. Again, really noting the personalised, individualised um, need for, 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 the, for that intervention in line with that avoidance of one-size-fits-all approaches. Our next recommendation is specific to patients coming into hospital after a hip fracture. And this recommendation is that after hip fracture, post-operative geriatric orthopaedic care with comprehensive multidisciplinary assessment, management and rehabilitation is recommended. And then our final recommendation, which is our strongest, highest quality um, recommendation, unlikely to change at that 1A, is that home safety interventions We've now further specified that they should ideally be delivered by an occupational therapist, should be arranged for older people at increased risk of falls after discharge as part of discharge planning while they're in hospital. So there are our um, draft recommendations in the hospital setting. You, you will see um, from our presentations around residential care and community that there are fewer recommendations in the hospital setting. Uh, and this is just reflective that, of not having the breadth of um, breadth of evidence in the hospital setting, which I think is also then reflective reflective of what a complex setting the hospital is. But certainly in the guidelines, there's a lot of information and a lot of best practice points around all the topics that are presented here on the slide. Um, and there's information about how to guide you, you considering these issues when you're looking at preventing, you know, assessing and preventing, um, assessing and implementing interventions to prevent your patients from falling in hospital. We will hear some more details um, around some of these issues from in further in our presentation as they have moved to being, um, they have moved to being recommendations in some areas. So on our fine, on my final slide, I just wanted to focus on some key considerations and practical points in terms of um, providing fall prevention in the hospital setting. So the first point being that interventions informed by an assessment provide benefit rather than the assessment as itself. So it's really important that we move beyond the assessment that we intervene to try to reduce our uh, reduce the risk of our patients falling. The second point is that tailored fall prevention interventions addressing risk should be implemented throughout inpatient stays and discharge planning. And what I really wanted to highlight here is what, you know, any of us working in the hospital setting know is that it's a, a really dynamic spot. Patients and settings are constantly changing and we really need to consider this when we're um, thinking about fall prevention in this space. Finally, Oh, not finally, next, um, falls prevention is everyone's business as um, the New South Wales CEC um, drum into us. So engaging multidisciplinary teams, older people and their significant others is crucial if we're going to prevent falls here. And finally, um, knowing that 
managing fall risk factors for falls will have wider benefits beyond fall prevention. It's really part of ensuring the best um, safety and quality of our older people while they're in hospital. Um, And so I really urge everyone to think about it in their um, clinical practice. That's it from me. On to Rick. Thank you very much, Charlotte. So, yeah, Rick, if you would like to start, start the presentation. And, yeah, give your overview of aged care. Thank you very much. Thanks, Marina. Um, so I'll just next point. So um, one thing that we know in residential aged care, we have strong evidence, is multifactorial fall prevention should be routine care for all older people in the facilities. And this should include regular reviews of personal and environmental risk factors and staff education. Next point. Um, And from this assessment of personal environmental risk factors, a targeted um, plan of care should be based, uh, should be developed based on the findings of a falls risk assessment. So I know that there's um, been a lot of research around how many residents in uh, high risk versus low risk versus medium risk, which is something that we did, say, 10, 15 years ago. But there is acknowledgement that all residents are a high risk to falls and then that uh, falls risk assessments are really useful in guiding care plan interventions. Next point. Um, we have some good evidence around tailored supervised exercise should be provided to those willing and able to participate. So in doing an intervention component analysis of Cameron's Cochrane review, we noticed that many of the exclusion um, characteristics for lots of different trials involved were those um, that couldn't walk. So for those who can walk, we know that tailored and supervised structured exercise um, has some strong evidence around it. Next point. And one of the um, interesting points that came out of the update of the Cochrane Review is that we had a lot of studies that had um, a, a follow-up point at the end of the intervention, but also a follow-up point looking at what happens after the intervention um, was completed. And we found that once the intervention finished, the, the positive effects of a fall prevention program was diminished, suggesting that in residential aged care, we need ongoing tailored and supervised exercise. So the concept of doing short and targeted um, programs and then just um, letting those a lot of those residents moving on to a, a, a recreational program or a program that has a high dominance of seated exercise is not going to be enough for those people that can mobilise. Next slide. Um, there are other um, evidence that came out of in these guidelines is that menus should be assessed by dietitians to ensure adequate provision of dairy foods that reflect older people's preferences. So this may involve at least three daily serves of dairy foods to meet calcium and protein nutritional nutritional requirements and certainly supports the evidence or the the experience that a lot of facilities are experiencing by, you know, really offering um, their residents a really nutritious meal. Um, And that um, Daily or weekly vitamin D should be administered unless contraindicated. We have very strong evidence around that. And that high monthly doses or, you know, the the, the previous once a year mega doses should be avoided. Strong evidence around that. Protective bone treatment should be prescribed for older people with osteoporosis or have a history of low trauma fractures unless contraindicated. So again, um, supporting that um, medical management of osteoporosis. Next point. Um, And then hip protectors can be considered for reducing the risk of fall-related fractures. So um, that's an area that continues to need um, looking at from a research point of view. Next slide. Um, As a clinician, I do remember when that green box emerged in residential aged care, and it was almost a gift to all of us clinicians working there because it was such a detailed approach to managing falls. Um, And so a lot of the recommendations from 20 years ago are still the same now in the new guidelines. Um, Fall risk assessment is useful when supported by appropriate interventions related to the risk. So it's very important that once you identify a risk that you address it. In particular, when it comes to balance and mobility assessment that measures change and guide exercise prescription. Next point. Cognitive impairment is really uh, important to consider, especially when it comes to managing delirium. So assessment and management of delirium is important. Next point. Um, Managing continence, reducing risk or preventing continence issues as they arise is still important. 
Um, the medical assessment and management, the medication management of syncope, dizziness and vertigo remain. Um, and it's important to um, continue with annual medication reviews by GP or pharmacist and annual eye examinations to reduce the risk in this frail population. And so that concludes the um, residential update. Thank you very much, Rick. Um, so Jasmine, would you like to start your presentation now, please? Uh, thank you. So I'll follow on now with the draft recommendations we've got for the, uh, the community. So as uh, for the residential aged care exercise is also um, the, uh, is also big, um, very important recommendation in the community guidelines. It's uh, the one that has the strongest. Uh, it's the strongest recommendation based on the highest quality uh, uh, evidence, and this is um, as you can see on this slide. Uh, coming from the uh, Cochrane review from uh, Cathy Sherrington, which showed that following um, exercise interventions, falls can be reduced by 23% in older community dwelling people. The second part of the, that same recommendation, uh, more specifically um, <coughs> details what programs uh, should contain. An exercise program should target balance and mobility can include strength training and should be undertaken two to three hours per week. And this is based on evidence from a, a, a detailed um, a systematic review, um, that which showed, uh, one of the tables is showed here. And if you can see on the third line, we can see that uh, programs that include a higher dose, so three hours per week of exercise that include balance and functional exercise, can reduce falls by um, 42 percent, which is uh, very uh, impressive, uh, as opposed to um, programs that include lower doses of exercise and do not include a uh, balance of functional um, exercises, then they don't uh, have any effects on falls. Um, finally, as part of that same recommendation on exercise, uh, and as shown in also the residential aged care guidelines, we know that for ensuring benefits on falls, uh, exercise program needs to be ongoing and they need to be designed and delivered by a health professional. By this we mean an exercise physiologist or a physiotherapist or an appropriately trained instructor. And by this we referring to people, um, so a trained instructor would be people who can adapt the exercise appropriately to the functional status of the, um, of the older person. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there's a second uh, recommendation regarding exercise in the community guidelines, which addresses um, specifically older people's uh, fall risk. Um, so next uh, point. So for older people who have a lower risk of falls, so who experience less than one fall, uh, basically who are um, not experiencing any falls, um, we suggest they can take part in community exercise and or safely exercise at home, as opposed to people with increased risk of falls, so people who experience at least one fall a year. Uh, we suggest or uh, we recommend that they follow individualized program with or without supervision or assistance from a health professional or appropriately trained instructor to ensure ex the exercise is delivered uh, safely and effectively. Uh, next, please. Um, additional interventions are to be um, uh, provided for those at increased and high risk of falls. So for all the people living in the community with an increased risk of falls, by this we mean we experience one to two falls per year, we uh, recommend that in addition to the exercise, they also um, uh, are provided with home and community safety information. And for this, uh, this is a strong recommendation with high quality evidence. Um, and for people at high risk of falls, we reiterate that they do not only need exercise, but they also need an individualized assessment from a health professional uh, that will lead to tailored intervention. So this um, recommendation is based on the Cochrane review by Hopewell et al um, from 2018. Next slide, please. Um, regarding home safety, we've got very high uh, 
quality evidence that home safety safety interventions do um, reduce um, falls uh, when delivered by an occupational therapist uh, and for all the people at increased risk of falls. Uh, next point. And this is uh, from um, the recently published co uh, Cochrane review, review, sorry, from Lindy Clemson, which showed that uh, there was a 38% reduction in falls after in-home fall hazards intervention in high-risk older people. And you can see the definition of high-risk older people here. So it's both with severe visual impairments, those who have fallen in the past year and even need help with everyday activities or have been recently discharged from hospitals, so frailer um, older people. Next slide, please. Um, now, we also recommend that older people at increased risk of falls with particular risk factor um, undertake some uh, specific intervention addressing these risk factors. So I've put these single interventions in uh, two tables on this slide and the next, and you can see the level of evidence on the right-hand side. So we recommend um, that people who have visual impairments due to cataract undertake cataract surgery as soon as um, practicable. practicable. Um, we recommend multifaceted podiatry interventions, uh, which would include some strengthening exercise of the foot and leg for people with foot problem or disabling foot pain. Um, there's um, some recommendation based on moderate quality evidence that uh, dual chamber cardiac pacemaker is recommended for carotid sinus hypersensitivity and for people who are um, on psychoactive medications or overfall uh, risk increasing drugs. Um, we do uh, recommend um, that there are uh, medication reviews by GPs and pharmacists to try to minimize these medications. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> we also still have the recommendation to replace um, uh, for people who have bifocal, multifocal, or progressive lenses, uh, they should um, use single lens glasses when undertaking outdoors activities. That's based on um, a large randomized control trial. Um, the people who have um, changes in their spectacle prescription should be uh, recommended to take care when mobilizing while adjusting to the change. Um, here we've got uh, finally the uh, recommendations regarding the vitamin people with vitamin D deficiency or who uh, take very little sunlight, and we do recommend daily or weekly uh, vitamin D supplements, and again to avoid high monthly doses and once yearly mega doses of vitamin D. And for people who have diagnosed osteoporosis or a history of low trauma fractures, um, it's recommended that they undertake some bone protective treatments unless contraindicated. So these are the single interventions that address particular risk factors. Next slide, please. So in summary, we can see what has changed since the 2009 guidelines. You can see that there's really an emphasis on implementation of interventions rather than just the assessment of risk. And there are different approaches to intervention for people with different levels of risk. So you saw low risk, increased risk, and high risk of falls. Uh, what remains, uh, next point, please. Um, since uh, what remains the same from the 2009 guidelines, so the intervention categories and the inclusion of best practice points um, guiding all aspects of care of older adults. Um, and these aspects uh, include syncope management, uh, dizziness management, vision, um, heat protectors, etc. cetera. Um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jasmine. So thank you to all the speakers, Steve, Charlotte, Rick and Jasmine, for a very good overview of your progress with the update of these guidelines. Definitely a massive amount of work that you've been putting on this. Um, yeah, so thank you for a very clear presentation. We are now going to move on to the questions time. So I would like to open the floor for questions. So if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand uh, or send your, your question in the chat. Um, Terry sent a message on the chat about the levels of recommendation, uh, but I think Kathy replied on the chat. Um, was that clear, Terry, or would you like uh, any of the speakers to expand on that point? <laughs> 
no, 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 Kathy's answered that one. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else have any questions or comments they would like to, to make? Oh, there is one here uh, on the chat from Tree. Um, for the community dwelling adults, a lot of the accommodation are medical based. What is your advice to the people working primary allied health teams? So maybe we can we can start with Jasmine, but then the others, Steve and the others, you are also welcome to joining the discussion. Um, hi. Um, want to make sure I understand the the question. So, um, Trin, do you refer to the single interventions like the ones for? Uh, cardiac problems or cataracts, etc. Is it what? Yes. Yes. So, um, you know, within so, um, you know, I guess in terms of those recommendations, like we do write a letter to the GP for things, but would you recommend? that in that letter to the GP that we ask the GP to follow up some of those things? I guess, uh, sorry, uh, we didn't hear very well the start of your answer, but uh, I suppose uh, I would imagine it would be the, the right way to go if you suspect uh, there's a, a specific uh, risk factor that cannot be addressed by your team. Uh, it would be a good idea to emphasize it with the GP and, yeah, follow up that to make sure it's it's uh, it's done uh, like things like cataracts it's now such a, um, a common surgery for example if you suspect there could be some vision problem it's really important to follow up yeah. i'm not sure right. if i answered correctly the question but uh, yeah. yes yes thank you uh, and <clears throat> just to um carry on i guess um i this this really emphasizes the multi-fact nature multifactorial nature of falls in older people and how everyone has a role to play and falls for everybody's business. Um, there certainly are recommendations that are relevant to, you know, medical care, but, you know, it's from head to foot. Um, you know, it involves visual interventions from optometrists through to podiatry interventions for problems with foot pain, et cetera. So I think there are some things that, you know, are for individual professions, but also clearly uh, there's evidence for multifactorial interventions and that requires input from you know multiple people and multi multiple disciplines so i think it's a matter of you know looking at each of them and where where, where people would be involved thank you steve um terry would you like to ask a question yes please um uh, regarding the recommendation regarding uh exercise i, I think rick was one who presented the, the one for the uh residential aged care setting um, and, and that we need to have supervised, tailored exercise, I guess, that's ongoing. Um, is the recommendation based purely on effectiveness studies or is it also based on economic evaluations? I'm particularly interested in economic evaluations conducted from the aged care service provider perspective. Look, I'll have a go at it answering the recommendation that we had for the false guidelines was mainly from the effectiveness studies looking at just the impact of exercise on falls rates what happens when the intervention stopped and what were um, common key features of the interventions that actually reduced falls and so that's where we came out with the tailored and structured um, so when it comes to cost effectiveness i might um, hand that over to steve but there's um, from my understanding of the literature, there's not a lot of cost effectiveness um, work happening in that residential aged care space to date. Yeah, I, I guess I, I'm mindful of the message that's going to the aged care providers in that we're basically telling them that they should be providing this style of exercise ongoing in, in a way, but um, from their perspective, they don't have a, a, I guess, a particularly good set of funding mechanisms yet to support that. Um, I, I just feel that tension there 
uh, that's that's there for the aged care service providers. And look, I appreciate the tension that's there because there is there is almost zero funding for there is zero funding for exercise in residential aged care. So what we're asking providers to do is to provide structured and supervised and tailored exercise um, out of their profits. So that is a challenge for the um, for the funders to change. Uh, and provide opportunities for funding so it makes it easy for industry to support these programs. Mm. But yeah, yes. I guess, I guess if I could carry on too, I mean, there was always a tension between what is best practice based on the evidence and what we think people could do and whether you water them down. So in general, we've we've gone with the evidence, left, left it at the evidence. This was based on um, further work with the Cochrane Systematic Review that was done specifically for this, uh, for these guidelines, where it actually, Sue Dwyer actually managed to tease out the effect of falls at the end of the intervention and on subsequent follow-up periods when people might have been followed up for another year or another six months. And it was very clear that the effect of the interventions were only apparent while people were in the trial. And beyond the trial, it was completely lost. So it's based on the evidence, and we do appreciate that this is best practice, and that's the target to aim for. Um, and uh, the economic issues, uh, you know, come into that as well. But that's where this, this is how they've been compiled. Thank you, Steve. The challenge is if you there are some studies that show that reducing falls in residential aged care save um, taxpayer money, but it's really about hospitalisation. There's not a lot of work done around burden of care and residential aged care and the impacts of that those sort of exercise programs can have on staffing levels because that's quite complex. Yeah, and if that's okay, I'm, I might add in to this point, Terry, because I've done a review uh, of exercise for prevention to inform the WHO deck guidelines, and this was on economic evaluations done in this space. So number one, there is just a few um, studies that have been done on aged care exercise for false prevention, looking at the value for money. Uh, and the couple that have done, they have shown promise, promising results with very low ISAs, um, indicating that you'd need just additional, one was additional $37 per fall prevented. But I think the key point is that the perspective they use wasn't the aged care provider perspective, which I think adds to your discussion and your point of who is funding those um, interventions. So that's definitely a space that we need more evidence in, for, in order to yeah, provide a better recommendation. Uh, with have in mind that ongoing exercise is important, as you know, highlighted by Steve and the evidence. So if that's okay, we're going to move on to our next question. So next one from Samantha. So she's saying that I've noticed that a lot of emphasis of strategies is on medication review and exercise, which would come under medical and allied health. What interventions would be implemented in teams of nursing? I can start with that. I'm not sure if you're referring to the hospital setting or not, potentially um, not. But certainly in terms of the hospital setting, there's a huge amount um, our nursing colleagues can do. I mean, if we're realistic, nurses are the people that spend the most time um, with patients. And so they've got a huge role, I think, in assisting with that education of patients. Um, you know, we have evidence to support that a lot of patients come into hospital and just it's not even on their radar that they they may fall. So, um, you know, educating them that, you know, they're they're more at risk of falling now they're, they're in hospital and educating them on strategies um, that are suitable to them or, or, or educating their family or carers. Um, around how they can really reduce that risk and help keep them safer in hospital. That, that's a huge role that nurses can play. Um, and then certainly in terms of providing that multifactorial um, really assessment-based intervention, that that really is going to work optimally if there's a, a team and allied health, a, a, you know, multidisciplinary nursing and allied health and medical team um, that, that's involved in those plans for patients to try to reduce their falls. Um, supervision, I, I notice, um, you know, you've mentioned some strategies around supervision, high visibility, that's got a really important role. Be careful with alarms because, you um, you know, there's evidence to show that they don't reduce falls, um, that there's certainly ongoing evidence, um, ongoing research into that. But, um, you know, it's it's not a, um, necessarily a, a magic fix in terms of um, preventing falls in the hospital setting. But 
yeah, I think there's a huge amount that um, nursing staff can do. And, yeah, hopefully that's given you some little practical tips. But certainly there'll be a lot more in the best practice points and the guidelines too that elaborate on all those different areas um, that were in that slide of mine. And, you know, just an extension in the expanding home care space, nurses uh, do a lot of case management. They do the initial assessments. They do the home reviews and identify the areas of risk. And so it's really, I think it's super important that the, the nursing teams understand their leadership in this space in not just referring, but identifying and educating in the home care and residential space. Thank yes, you. and that reminds me too, sorry, then my last one, and that yeah. is the other really important point I think for nursing is that constant reassessment and looking for changes in your patient in the hospital setting, um, you know, especially in terms of cognition, um, but but in any other ways your patient's status may have changed while they're in hospital and then being able to respond to that. Sorry, you reminded me, Rick. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Charlotte and Vic. Um, and just a point from Kathy. So Kathy Sheridan mentioned on the chat that her internet's not fantastic at the moment, um, but the recommendations, they came from these studies that haven't been undertaken, so not necessarily comprehensive. And there will be also practice points that will be added to the guidelines recommendations that will cover some of these issues uh, that have been discussed here. Um, so moving on to our next question from Dimitri. So um, any recommendations on use of technology for false prevention? Um, technology is relatively new. Uh, and, you know, how, how technology can mean telehealth, which can be synchronous um, um, video conference assessments where professionals link with people remotely. We've got the use of um, wearables to encourage people to measure their physical activity and exercise and even falls. Um, so there's um, a lot of evidence emerging around, there is some evidence emerging around the positive use of technology such as apps. So NIRA has got the Standing Tall app um, that's in research at the moment that will be tested um, in, in continuing to be tested to sh show the benefit of um, uh, an exercise app. So it, it's a certainly a growing space and um, I suspect in the next couple of years we'll see a lot more uh, evidence in this and systematic reviews will be able to tell a clearer story about the role of technology, what aspects of technology will, are useful. Yes, just to carry on, yet, yeah, technologies are discussed, I think, in all three volumes in the community, uh, particularly around wearables that, you know, have... Um, scope for detecting falls and alerting people to increase fall risk. It's still um, a work in progress. They've worked very well uh, in some cases when they're aligned with someone who's actually working uh, at, on a you know a hot desk to follow up if a near fall has actually occurred. It is a work in progress, as uh, Rick has said. But I think you know we're all uh, have you know open minds about where this can go and how it can certainly add to. Um, you know, our ability to intervene and uh, improve patient care. Thank you, Steve. Um, so moving on to another question from Julia. So she's asking, any comment on scenarios in hospital where the emphasis is so much on reducing risk and keeping patients safe that patients become more sedentary and lose independence? Yes, that that um, yeah, it's it's a complex and you know an issue that we're certainly aware of. That you know, yeah, it's a proxy. You know, the patients aren't falling, but it's because they're not getting up and moving at all. And certainly, um, a, as I mentioned, there's evidence that things like falls alarms that can sort of be, you know, almost default restraints don't actually um, reduce bedside falls in hospitals. Um, you, you know, I, I think. There's mentions of, you know, it's important that when we're looking at fall prevention, we look at it as a whole picture and, um, are, you know, and are looking at other outcomes as well as um, fall prevention. So potentially looking at length of stay as well, you know, if a patient's not moving and becoming less mobile, that could increase their length of stay. So if we're not reducing length of stay, we can look at things like that. I'm looking at discharge destinations as well um, to ensure that the interventions that we're providing for patients aren't at the cost of um, other aspects of, of their health and um, quality of life. I hope that addresses that. 
question enough. Oh, here we go. Um, yes, yeah, she's Julie saying thank you. So I believe it has addressed. And I've just noticed that Sue Daya has also joined the session and she was involved in the guideline um, work as well. So feel free to add um, anything you want to choose, Sue. Just, yeah, raise your hand or unmute yourself. And um, Okay. Yeah, much apologies for my late joining. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's great to have you here. Thank you for joining. Um, okay, so I'll move to a comment from uh, Living. So, hi, could I please check best practice recommendations for identifying false risk in community? Uh, so, false risk for all the people in the community. So, FROPCOM is screen and assessment, the best practice for community clients. And can this assessment be identified by any disciplines like social work or does it need to be completed by certain discipline? So, yeah, asking what is the best uh, tool for doing this screen? So is the false risk for all the people in the community recommended and can it be done by other disciplines such as social work or is there specific disciplines that need to use it? I um. I was just uh, looking at what what we included in the extended version of the guidelines, and we still um, uh, have the FROPCOM screen uh, and the FROPCOM assessment, the longer version, uh, included and recommended. Um, I guess the emphasis, as uh, we mentioned, for uh, all the settings is really in making sure uh, even though you might uh, screen your particip your uh, your patient or assess them, uh, the key is really uh, putting in place the interventions, implementing the interventions that target the risk factors that you've identified. So um, that's really the important uh, reminder here. And can it be identified by any disciplines? I guess if you're trained to... Um, to, to conduct the assessment and if you've got some insight into um, how to address the risk factors, um, I, I can imagine they're pretty, well, they, they are pretty simple um, uh, screens and assessment to conduct could be done by um, trained, trained uh, uh, professionals. I'm not sure if anyone's got any additional comments Look, my, understand, I was just gonna, my understanding of the frop com and the frop screen is that anyone trained can do it but we all have to acknowledge what our scope of practice is but if you look at this that that screen it is very much uh, highlighting areas of risk and, and and assessment and it's very um it's a very easy um assessment to follow so i know it's commonly done by nurses as a part of their initial assessment the frop com because they they have a, a, a very wide understanding of all the different risk factors for older people. Jasmine, was that the only screen that was recommended? Sorry, in terms of the screen, it's the only one we've included in the still included in the um, in the mm -hmm. guidelines. But in terms of assessment, we've also emphasised um, uh, some other tools such as a quick screen which has uh, uh, evaluates uh, uh, various factors. And um, yeah, the quick screen, we, we do emphasize it as well in the guidelines. So if, uh, if people are not familiar with it, it includes uh, assessments of, um, uh, it takes about 10 minutes to, um, to conduct and it includes some assessments uh, of vision, uh, of touch sensation, uh, standing balance, lower limb strength, coordination, um, and some questions about um, um, polypharmacy and previous falls. And there are some additional um, physical assessments as well that are recommended, such as gait, speed, timed up and go, sit to stand, et cetera, that gives mm -hmm. a more comprehensive under uh, understanding of a person's functional abilities. Yeah, yeah, full mobility, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. Um, so let's move to another question. I've just missed a previous question from Kirsten. So um, so she's asking, for community clients, is the recommendation specifically for occupational therapy home and safety assessment compared with a community physiotherapy assessment? Mm 
I um I w I went back to the um, Cochrane review by Lenny Clemson, and um, the comparisons was between OTs versus any other professions. So it could have been versus physios or nurses trained in identifying uh, home hazards, etc. I hope this answers uh, your question. And I think the issue here is it's not just the provision of, you know, a few home aids that you could get, you know, handy andy to deliver. It's the way that it's done in a professional way to maximise the safety of the person in the house, to help them with transfers, to, you know, to live, you know, an ecological approach to keep people safe in the home. I think that's the, a major point of distinction here. It's just not putting in a, uh, taking up a mat, putting in a handrail. It's it's more than that. It's uh, it's the professional implementation of this. Thank you, Steve. So I think we might move on to our last question. So do any of the guidelines offer suggestions about non-sleep socks? I can start on that one, as I know it's in some hospitals a bit of a controversial issue. Um, certainly the, the um, evidence around, you know, the limited evidence around non-slip socks is summarised from memory. Um, certainly there's no strong evidence to demonstrate that using anti-slip socks um, reduces falls in hospital, but we do know that appropriate footwear um can can and in a or can reduce your risk of falling, but and in a and appropriate footwear can re, sorry appropriate footwear can reduce your risk of falling, and inappropriate footwear can increase your risk of falling. Um, so you know if anti if um non slip socks are being used, it's really important they're being used in the absolute most appropriate way, which often you know just um clinically I know that they're not. Um, yes, and knowing that, that there's no evidence specifically looking at um, anti-slip socks. I think the study that looked at anti-slip socks showed that they did um, improve gait performance somewhat in one small study, um, but that wasn't actually around, didn't actually reduce falls. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, and we might actually have two minutes for one last question that just came in. Uh, yes, I think Kathy has just... Um, has just um, answered the question. So the question was, the guidelines mentioned that false prevention don't end at inpatient stays and extend to discharge. If one patient were to be discharged home, who would be doing the assessments and how often? Um, so Kathy has just replied to that, saying that that's a good question. We don't always have systems in place for these, but the evidence would suggest that we should. Um, so... I don't think we have any other additional questions. Does anyone else want to make any additional comment? Any of the speakers would like to make any final remarks before we close the session? Only to say, please look out for the consultation and we welcome all feedback and comments. And I think that might be coming out in uh, the next week or two and hopefully we'll be open for a month or more. Fantastic. Yeah, we definitely keep an eye for that. Is there anything else from the other speakers today? No? Okay. So I'd like to thank you, everyone, for joining. We had more than, we had, I think, 80 people joining at some point. So it's fantastic to see so many, so many people joining one of our seminars. So thank you so much for coming today, and I'll close the session now. Bye-bye, everyone, and have a nice afternoon.